I should, I'll hit record. Yeah. I had the idea a few weeks ago where like you write the best novel ever. You're talented. You can do it. Right. But then you give everyone the worst names ever and have everyone introduce themselves like James Bond. So it'll be like, <laughs> my name's Buka, Sam Buka, <laughs> you know, or, <laughs> or, or yeah, yeah. <laughs> my name's Johnson, Dirty Johnson. <laughs> Dirty Johnson. <laughs> And one guy's just name is Honest, <laughs> like <laughs> Syphilis Jenkins. But I, I am um, when my uh, name is Fard, Tuck Fard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the winner name, Tuck Fard. <laughs> Al de Pants, you. This um, sounds wrong in several ways. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's like I, I uh, this sounds a lot like uh, when uh, I first moved to Athens, I was working at a video store, the game Final Fantasy VII came out, which is now considered such a classic that they've remade it. Um, I was not interested in playing RPGs, really, but my roommates were like, you know, Julie and her brother really got into it. But the thing was, I had already found all the characters and named them. So they <laughs> had to then play the rest of Final Fantasy VII uh, with names like... I don't even remember what they were big pussy and all this other stuff or fat pussy. I think it was one. So as they were discussing the game, as time went on, they would just say these names as a matter of course, you know, having long since gotten over the, how filthy they all were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Why not? You know, that's just, that's just cop talk, man. Yeah. No, one of them, I think his name was just fucking a, <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> right? Fuck a B. It has more holes. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, I'm turning off my TV. I was going to watch the last few minutes of the episode again, but then I realized I'd put in the next disc because I was watching the next episode. So I was like, screw it. I'll just go by the, by the last viewing. <laughs> I took them kitty nap at the, the last second. Last uh -huh. Oops. But it was like the third time I saw it. So it's probably fine. <laughs> Hooyah. Let me see. Got my notes there. Okay. I guess we'll do this. Oh, before we do this, let me put the prologue on a on another page. It's a really long one, so oh. <laughs> choose your voice wisely. Not not like Mark. I don't know if that one aired yet or not, where he, he didn't know what he was doing and it just sounded like five kinds of insane. What did he do? He started doing one voice, but then kind of switched to another voice. Or maybe that was Luke. Maybe 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 that's a certain. No, that's where he started trying to do French and realized he couldn't do it. And, oh my god! Know. Why not just read it? I don't know, because because that's what everyone else does. So they want to they want to be different. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> wow. My my thing about trying to go too big with it is that you actually screw up reading it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's the weird thing that I, I never read them, right? So, <laughs> oh man, I got to do a little, it's all funky on when I put it out here. Okay. Sorry. I'm trying to make it more readable for you. <laughs> so, da, 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 da. Well, that's cool, dude. Okay. There we go. That's, mm -hmm. I guess you can see I what I'm doing it. anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay. We'll get to that in a moment. Let us begin. I'll leave just a few minutes of silence so I can spot it. Did I say minutes? <laughs> Hello, welcome to Time Enough Podcast. It's where we dive into episodes of the Twilight Zone and beyond. This is Matt here, coming to tell us the whole truth today is Andrew Shearer. Hi. Can you handle the truth? Mm, no, <laughs> I, I was just I was just hearing about um in a few good men when um they when Jack Nicholson was on set for that scene even when they were doing coverage on other actors he'd uh, just go full blast like when he didn't need to right and they're like you can tone it down you're not this isn't your cut right and he's like I just like acting. <laughs> That's a good Nicholson. Um, <laughs> I remember going to see a few good men uh, when my friends all did because it was like. You know, uh, it was just very well reviewed and it was just not the kind of movie that I went to see. So, yeah, I, I took my girlfriend to it and like pretty much every movie between 92 and 95 made out during the whole thing. OK, well, that's never, never saw that's, one frame of the movie. OK, well, that's I mean, that's that's fine. I mean, it's, again, great movie, but not yet. Yeah, if I want to see some Nicholson, it's uh, what is it? it's, you know, 
five easy pieces or the shining or, or the are, last detail the last oh detail God, the cool. last detail see that's i am the well i can't say the quote but you know the shore <laughs> patrol the blankety blank shore patrol <laughs> yeah 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 just the, you know, the the filthiest movie to what big lebowski is it well they were <laughs> Navy, yeah yeah, yeah of course it's, it's sailor talk yeah yeah it made uh, sense no sailors today though uh this is the whole truth and I'll trivia it up a bit before we start talking about Jack Nicholson's entire career, because he's not in the show. <laughs> <laughs> Original air date was January 20th, 1961, which was the same day John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th president of the United States. So not by accident, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a script by Rod Serling. Director James Sheldon was a television mainstay from the 50s to the 80s, and his long list of credits include a myriad of classic shows like MASH, The Man from Uncle, and The Love Boat, just to name a few. Harvey Honeycutt was played by Jack Carson. Carson had a classic film career, playing the comedic sidekick to some of Hollywood's biggest leading men, like James Cagney in The Strawberry Blonde and Cary Grant in Arsenic and Old Lace. Loring Smith was honest Luther Grimbley. His on-screen career is just a smattering of supporting roles, but he made a splash acting both on Broadway and on the West End. He will return to the zone in I Dream of Genie, which is different than the sitcom I Dream of Genie. Yes. Which, which is not different than the sitcom Bewitched, at least in my universe. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I think I just pissed off a few people there. <laughs> no, I mean, you have your... You have your favorites. <laughs> I mean, I, well, anyway, we could, <laughs> I could talk about that, but I won't. In con, I, yeah, I honestly haven't seen much of those shows since I was like five years old anyway. So I'm, I'm just talking out of the, 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 the West End there. <laughs> okay. In contrast, the old man played by George Chandler appeared in supporting roles in around 140 films, but he's probably best known as Uncle Petrie Martin on the TV show Lassie. I don't know if that accent was accurate at all because Lassie's another show I haven't seen since I was five. Hmm. Except, except for that Ben Stiller sketch with Manson. That was great. Ever see that? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I got the eye of the tiger and I don't know who to kill first. Okay, there, that's what Uncle Petri Martin probably says. Right, well done. That's an exact quote from an episode of Lassie. Our young car buyers, Jack Ging, who would later gain renown as General Harlan Bull Fulbright on the A-Team. Um, he just passed on September 9th, 2022 at the age of 90. Oh. Well, 90 is a pretty ripe one, I guess. Yeah. Irv was played by Artie Johnson, best known for being the dirty old man on a park bench in Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Um, I guess since I mentioned the last guy died at the age of 90, so did he, but that was in 2019. So it's not quite as uh, just last month as, as no, but uh, I knew it was recent though, or fairly recently. Yeah. Okay. I, I guess you, you go old school with the uh, prologues, don't you? Well, but, no, no, I, you did a weird one once. You, you gave me a bizarre one at one point in time, but uh, like I said, this is kind of a long one. So you might want to, you know, be ready for the, the hall. Go ahead. Well, yeah, we'll do some. I like to do sterling by drawing my teeth out on the top. All right, here we go. This, as the banner already has proclaimed, is Mr. Harvey Honeycutt, an expert on commerce and con jobs, a brash, bright, and larceny loaded wheeler and dealer who, when the good Lord passed out a conscience, must have gone for a beer and missed out. And these are a couple of other characters in our story. A little old man in a Model A car, but not just any old man, and not just any Model A. There's something very special about the both of them. As a matter of fact, in just a few moments, they'll give Harvey Honeycutt something that he's never experienced before. Though the good offices of a little magic, they will unload on Mr. Honeycutt the absolute necessity to tell the truth. Exactly where they come from is conjecture but as to where they're heading for. This we know, because all of them and you are on the threat who did it by Joe. You know, you could, you could also like smoke a pack of Chesterfields and, and then you won't have to dry the teeth on your own. That little island full of gay romance. <laughs> I, I've, I've never really smoked, but um, 
the song Dark Alley I did, which is in the movie Psycho Vixens in the bar scene. Mm-hmm. I, I did pack a, I smoked like a pack of cigarettes before doing the vocal just so I could be as Tom Waits as possible. A pack? <laughs> Not really, probably two, but okay. <laughs> I just I just told you to smoke a pack of Chesterfield, so I thought I should keep the terminology going. But yeah, um, I don't know about a, p- a pack would have made you just vomit th- into the microphone. Yeah, as I was saying that, I was like, that can't be right because I would have vomited into the microphone. <laughs> pack of what am I talking about? I recorded the vocals in the toilet though, so it would have been like easy to deal with that if that had come to pass. Weird on the toilet, not on the toilet in the room in in the bathroom. Okay. Sorry, in Japan, you have to say like toilet and then bathroom because they're in different rooms. The toilet's in the toilet, the bath is in the bathroom. Gotcha. And rarely, well, in apartments, the, sometimes it's the same, but in houses, they're always separate. So, yeah. You have to, you have to watch your terminology a little bit, right? Um, something I've never done before is actually bought a car like on a lot. I sold my car once, but I've never bought a car. Mm-hmm. like gone through the process um it sucks yeah because in america I, I bought a car for my my first car is i bought for my roommate and then my aunt sort of handed me down her car because she got a that volkswagen beetle and a year later yes. decided she didn't like driving a stick shift so she gave me the stick shift and uh got like the turbo or something mm-hmm. which, oh, no. i like the stick shift and in japan i don't i don't i'm at work when they whenever that happens and yeah which is actually only one. So yeah, I haven't been in on, on the process. Have you, have you been in yeah. on the process? Oh yeah. A lot of times. Yeah. 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 So, my adult life. How was it? Did you have to deal with honey cuts? Um, this is the way they do it. Um, they give you a nice version of honey cuts when they're trying to sell you the car. Then once they sell you the car, they give you like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> to work out the details. To work out the details. Yeah. That's where like they, okay. the, the, they put all the nice guys on the sales floor and all the like just sycophants on the yeah, in this in the actual like rooms to do the paperwork. They're okay, because I was thinking the closest I got to this, um, and I, I'll I'll preface the story a little bit. When when I was a kid, my my mom, as you probably know, is kind of ultra thrifty. <laughs> So, so when we'd go places like Disney World or even like Colonial Williamsburg, she'd always do the thing where you get the free tickets and you have to listen to someone's timeshare pitch. I've done this too. Right. So, so when I was like, um, about 25 or something, um, when uh, my wife and I came to did our delayed honeymoon at Disney World or whatever, I was like, oh, well, that worked out well. Cause as a kid, you're just like, oh, I was just like bored for an hour. You know, I read a book, that sort of thing, but sure. Yeah, yeah, but in this case, I actually had to deal with them, and uh, yeah, that sucked. <laughs> yeah, I, I can remember um, uh, my experience with that was that, like, when you say no to one person, they send in another, like, pushier person. And then and that then, person tries to guilt trip you. Yeah, like, and then that you know, person, like... then finally, as you're actually in your car and successfully leaving, there's a guy in the back seat that pops up with a bomb strapped to his chest. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And you I don't need, buy this you know, time show, I'm gonna blow this up. This whole thing up. <laughs> everybody's dying today. Buy the you don't share. buy the time share, nobody's getting the time share. <laughs> that's right. So uh yeah. I'm yeah. in a coffin, that's what you get. Anyway, yeah, my wife's edict after that was uh yeah, we're not doing that again. <laughs> no, no. We're just I, gonna buy a, the tickets. Sure, yeah, that was a one and done for us as well. Yeah, yeah. So um but uh, man, my parents like went through that crap at least like five times or something. I don't, I don't know what was up with that. Nerves so, of steel. I guess so. Yeah. So yeah, I'm not a wheeler dealer. I, I couldn't like, you know, I couldn't sell money probably. So like mm-hmm. that I'm giving away. <laughs> no, I can't say I've ever been in a position where I had to hawk things as in have to for my mm-hmm. job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've had a little bit of that being in the, 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 private end of education stuff occasionally but yeah it's not my my will forte i'm not forting with will on that one (laughs) i I don't know why that came to mind i think that every time i see that guy's name okay that's cool um anyway yeah 
so we get the young buyer who looks just like Mark Wahlberg, but hopefully has like a better past history. Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> I just keep I, that's thing. Season one, we're all like the Hollywood Babylon stories on the Twilight Zone. And season two, we keep getting like good players who look <laughs> exactly like other people. It's really weird. <laughs> I agree. I agree. As a matter of fact, I was when I when I saw Artie Johnson, I was like, hey, that guy looks like a young Artie Johnson. <laughs> Well, that works because it was already Johnson, but that I know, you but know, I was guy... so sure that it was some other guy be- just because of the way season two is. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I definitely felt like I was watching Mark Wahlberg for, for half the time. Um, sure. Of course, that's that's just for funsies, right? That's just for a giggle or two. And then the, the Model A shows up, which that is a full on hipster car. I mean, that would be the star of your lot now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, back then they were just pieces of crap. And um oh what, except what, what what is he oh I always used to say when people are like what car would you like I'd be like yeah I want like a thirty eight Ford coupe that would be like awesome I mean I'd want to like you know retrofit it with like modern stuff inside but uh so that it runs yes that yeah, I'd like the fender to stay on unlike the one in this but uh <laughs> that was funny <laughs> yeah, twice <laughs> um but yeah a black Ford coupe man uh, I always thought that would be like awesome to roll around and now i want the batmobile more like the 60s but the adam west batmobile that's what i'd like my car to be now but i think you could literally roll around in that because i'm fairly certain they were just made of reinforced steel and it was just sort of you know if you hit any other car on the road today it would just obliterate that other car so it was it's batman's batmobile was not a tank like in the nolan movies and this model a would be the tank yeah (laughs) <laughs> no, no. I did wonder why would you want a tank-based car? Tanks are slow. It's like this is based on the, what Abrams tank or something. It's like that that that, that moves like thirty miles an hour at like most. <laughs> well, so you get the jet engine on it. Oh, okay. Then it moves at forty-eight miles per. <laughs> jet tank. That's a, there's a good idea for an '80s action show. <laughs> jet tank. <laughs> You know, and then they could do a crossover with Jet Tank versus Airwolf. That would be fantastic. That's we can right. bring a Manimal as, as for like surprise cameo. Manimal eating a manwich. That would be good commercial placement. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the ways he sell he sells the car for twenty five bucks, which I guess is cheap even in nineteen sixty one. It's really hard to tell, you know, what that means anymore. Is Use that the like, inflation calculator. Is that like two million dollars now? <laughs> Australian, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, the car is haunted. That's that's fun. Have you ever, have, ever had a haunted car? Yeah. Well, I at least had one that smelled dead inside. <laughs> well, it was our friend's car that smelled like dirt, I remember. <laughs> oh. There was some... It was uh, Jeff's car. He he had had some incident at Stone Mountain, and I was in his car a week later, and the whole thing smelled like dirt. And he was playing Smashing Pumpkins' "Gish" at top volume. So anytime I hear that album now, the smell of dirt comes to mind. Oh, it would have been funny if he listened to that record, "Dirt." Allison changed dirt. Oh, that would have um, made more sense. Yeah, I I um I once rode around. Uh, I had a well. Um, a friend of mine's father picked us up from the mall and that car was basically a Flintstone. Like you would look down at the floorboard in the back and you saw the street. All oh, right. That's cool. <laughs> I was like, you know, I better keep my feet up here. I'm not talking about a lemon though. I'm talking about haunted. Oh, I actually haunted. Um, I mean, I would, I would have to say I had a car that reminded me of Christine. That was the big white, cutlass oh yes 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 that was yeah that thing um yeah it i would say it it actively tried to to sever my legs on many occasions (laughs) you still have your legs legs cut off legs cut off yeah man going going well so far there you go um uh, visiting my my aunt my grandparents in delaware back in the 90s it might still be there i remember driving past on a route one or something I don't know if that's the right route, but uh, there was some like, was it like an art installation where someone had taken a car and like put like, this guy sold me this car and it's a lemon. And then there was like a little sculpture of a lemon and stuff. And it was just like this bizarre art installation of some guy that was to- pissed off about the car he bought. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when life gives you a lemon. 
You make a weird art installation. You make a weird art installation. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that certainly came to mind. Um, now, of course, I sometimes we say you see the, the tw we know the twist because it's a really famous Twilight episode, um, Twilight Zone episode, or, you know, you can totally see it coming. Um, mm -hmm. I would argue uh, 22 in a few weeks, great episode, but you can see that twist coming, you know, forever, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, this one, I don't think you could ever really no. guess this twist. <laughs> no, this is a very... Uh, I mean, it, I, I don't even know if I could, I would, I would describe it as a shock ending, not in like the traditional sense or even in the twilight zone sense, but in the sense that it was one of the rare instances where they made a joke out of an actual living political figure. Right. And, and that's why I put in my trivia, this came out on inauguration day. So it was like very much targeted at the end call jack candy and tell him khrushchev's gonna tell him the truth about everything you know <laughs> oh my God, yeah that was oh it was just it was wild and you know you tend to and i don't know if it's super clear in, in some of the other episodes because serling rarely was able to be like as political especially by season two where they found out that kids really loved the show mm -hmm. you know and so he was rarely ever was writing for adults even though it was on late enough to where he you know it was de definitely an adult show, but uh, yeah, he was just tried to avoid controversy kind of at every turn. Yeah, I mean, uh, this was politics in very, you know, large strokes. I mean, it's not like anyone's going to be like, what? He's he's dissing Khrushchev, you know? I mean, well, he, I mean, uh, Serling is anti-communist. I mean, he was definitely, you know, his progressive stuff that we've talked about in the past, um, uh, I don't think you know, covered absolutely everything because he was a real like pro America. Um, and, you know, he's a war veteran and, and he, um, yeah, very anti-communist, uh, which was in line with a lot of the popular opinion of the time. But if you, you know, like were to do this episode today and replace to it, you know, call Trump and tell him Ken John's going to tell him the truth. That wouldn't wear very well or call Biden and tell him, you know, Putin's going to tell him the truth. Now it wouldn't, on inauguration day that i feel like that wouldn't really people would be like looking at their screen sideways like what <laughs> yeah no it's true and so but it is yeah it, it's it was it's so it's a yeah i hadn't seen this one in a while and um because it wasn't it was it's only the only times i watch it or when i'm going through and the, the entire run on my discs which i don't do like yearly or anything um so i was like whoa <laughs> So what, what keeps you away from this one out of curiosity? I, I watched this about three times before the podcast, but it's not one I'd seen or remembered seeing before. Um, I think that's the thing. It, it's not it one it's, you tend to remember. Is it because it's comedic? Is it because it's on video? That That's one thing that, that's been coming up with the six video <sighs> episodes. It's like, this is the first one where I'm like, maybe the video fits because it makes it look like a weird used car commercial. Mm, I mean, that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it is the video format really sort of told on them as far as it being like i think they're okay with the stuff that's all interior sets like the ones that are in a house but i don't think it served it very well in terms of you know this episode largely takes place outdoors yeah this and one basically felt like a stage play yeah i don't feel like it it i don't I, I don't feel like it was served very well that aspect of it of you know trying to simulate an actual outdoor location i don't think the videotape served it very well but I don't think it's that. I think it's the kind of sameness um, to a lot of better episodes where you've got this object that the character has that either, you know, makes gives them powers of some kind or gives them prescience of some kind. You know what I mean? And um, they don't, I don't know, the gotcha is not as big. Um, the twist, if you could call it that, is the fact that it's, haunted and makes you tell the truth so well i would I say the twist is the kushchev's not going to tell the truth i feel like that was the actual twist because the uh, it's supposed to be but i the don't car makes you tell the truth is like what five minutes into the episode right yeah yeah so to find that out at the end might have been i don't know after all the years go by might have maybe played better i just it's not one of the ones where i really remember the characters it's not one of the ones where 
I even remember how it ends. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, the, I think it's the sameness to other ones that I, I like more. You know, I think there was one in season two where it was a, about a coin, you know, and things like that. And so um, that's a little cooler to me than just this. Because you see, you talk about a haunted car. Well, you want like something spectral to happen, like Christine or, you know what I mean? Uh, or somebody to be dead. I, I don't know. Just calling it haunted and then have it really just have a curse that like, well, we think of Liar Liar now, the Jim Carrey movie. And there's, I think, um, what was the other one? Something Words with uh, Eddie Murphy. Something like that. Although one that came to, that came to mind for me, especially because he is starting to talk to um, to to honest, what's his name, um, Grimly, uh, like kind of a being there vibe. Because Peter Sellers yeah. is just so in that movie, he's just so like basically he's so Peter Sellers that he can't do anything but tell the truth in simple metaphors, which plays yeah. to the politicians like mad you know <laughs> yeah no it's true and and you know this may just may well have been uh you know a vehicle for serling to make his commentary as much as he was kind of allowed or felt free to do you know because I mean? episode tur turnover rate yeah they probably would have been yeah they would have filmed this shot this like right after the election oh and now let's schedule it for inauguration day because that's our normal air date so yeah you know. and, and in that regard I mean, in other in the ways that we've talked about, I think it's it's not one of Serling's stronger scripts. Yeah, it certainly has a little more of a ham-fisted vibe. Though I really do like the shyster dialogue. That's that's is is that term okay now? <laughs> no, it, it I, yeah, because you're saying shyster, never... you're not saying you okay, know, one yeah, of yeah. <laughs> other things. But um, he that's funny. Like the stuff he's saying is funny. Like, and it's funny to hear an actor who, you know, you establish him as, as a, you know, a shade tree salesman or whatever they do. I love very your face, well. man. <laughs> Before then uh, turning him around. I want to so, do that more like the dude though. I love your face, man. <laughs> <laughs> you have to say so many curse words. <laughs> so but, no, it, it's, that's all well and good, but it just, to me, um, I don't know. I don't even think it's the videotape for me because some of the videotape episodes, I forget I'm watching the videotape, you know, but uh, yeah. this one, I, I, it never feels naturally outdoors. I've like said it on another episode or two, like they could have like targeted which ones they did on video a little better. Yes. Uh, and I'm actually curious what you think, because I felt the last one you did with me, I, the beholder, great on film, don't want it on videotape. I'm like, that one would have made sense on videotape. <laughs> yeah. And also yeah, no, I, obscure the effects um nervous man in a four dollar room was already cost saving because it's two actors on one set so yeah yeah that one could yeah. be videotape why not you know <laughs> but um yeah, then they got anyone that's it's supposed to be stagey anyway anything that's mostly interiors videotape fine um but when you're dealing with stuff taking place outside imagine some of the ones where it has iconic outdoor scenes that just on videotape would just well, night of the meek is mostly city streets and it's like eh, this doesn't quite look right mm -hmm, um no lateness of the hour i guess is like it's all indoors and, mm -hmm. and such but i was like man it, it would have a better like gothic feel if it was on film so um, no that one is one of the ones i really like and has some real punch and yeah i i think it's i i think the uh as a you know for the legacy i think it's sort of been betrayed by that uh by that videotape and then, I, uh, you know, we just, I, I've just recorded the 22 episode I, that, and that one kind of works because it's that hazy, dreamy feeling. And it's mostly indoors. So I guess mm -hmm. you could argue that one actually was, is the best fit for where it is. Yeah. Cause the whole truth comes out just feeling like, like it would have felt a whole lot less cheap on film, for like you're saying, you know? Yeah. And so, no, I, I don't like avoid it, like maybe because of that. You know, if anything, I'm always like, oh, right, this one was tape. And it's obvious which ones are tape. Uh, but um, yeah, it's more of just that you know, there's other ones with uh, where there's an object that that does that gives somebody some powers or prescience that I, I, I prefer to this one. Oh, the the other one is, um, that that I thought really was good on this episode was uh, when his assistant shows up with the the new si sales signs posters. Oh, 
those are <laughs> not ready to go <laughs> no see that's funny and and i know that this was i think mostly written for humor for the audience but you know serling is trying to get his licks in there with you know in which way he can and, and nothing more obvious than the fact that the shock we were talking about which is that he actually you know names khrushchev in the show has him as a character that that said when the um when the assistant realizes he's never getting a raise and sucker punches uh Punchy. <laughs> honey cut it's like the worst slowest sucker punch ever <laughs> yeah it's a little laughable and, and and it's not a Twilight Zone thing because I think it was in the last flight we got a fantastic sucker punch. So yeah, um, no, it's the, not like it they just, couldn't do it. No, I mean it's just a it's a small set, and you know it's supposed to be like a holy crap moment, and it kind of is. Like when I was watching, I was like, "Ooh, damn!" But uh, still, no, it doesn't it doesn't do any favors for them. It just feels like you said, very stagey. Um. Let's start with our questions on this episode. In this episode, who entered or took a transit through the Twilight Zone? The car? Well, the car was built in the Twilight Zone, according to the old man. He's like, from the day it was built, it's been, you know, cursed. <laughs> oh, right. So it just stayed cursed, didn't it? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, obviously, there's a sequence of owners that i guess while they own the car they're in the twilight zone i would definitely say by the end of the episode honeycutt has exited the twilight zone and khrushchev goes in yeah khrushchev's next and it's the old man that's honeycutt then it's khrushchev yeah so that would follow and then he'll have trouble selling it with the the communist system of 1961 <laughs> <laughs> i don't even want to think about that part he'll sell it to chairman mao <laughs> oh god that's terrible <laughs> however likely yeah so um are there any like ancillary characters i i guess the couple buying the card is just there they're just dealing with the scumbag so that yeah i mean they they'll definitely be like why did he why did he start changing telling us weird stuff later but yeah yeah no they they leave they they actually escape before they're actually they get anywhere ivy is just uh you know he's he's just a burnt assistant so he, mm -hmm. he i guess he's a little deeper in because his boss and his uh livelihood is, is going bonkers but he again he leaves before that goes on too long although he does mm -hmm. make the signs first so there's that he does <laughs> are the signs from the twilight zone hmm i mean he made them but had he made them while i guess if he made them while um, Honeycutt was in the Twilight Zone, then maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe for the second, the do they deserve their trip? Well, I feel like the focus there should mostly go on the old man and Honeycutt, and, unless you mm -hmm. disagree. But um, how about those guys? What do you think? Do they deserve their trips to the Twilight Zone? Or did they gain anything or lose anything? Mm. Honeycutt totally deserved it he sucked well yeah but then he kind of comes out roses at the end right so maybe he did not get what he deserves <laughs> mm, true yeah he, that's that's true that's true that's well, i guess he's getting a divorce so <laughs> yeah i was gonna say I, I don't know i don't know that that little period of his life until he finally sold the car i don't know that he could like undo some of the damage there i mean he's, <laughs> he's got no career prospects and definitely no good job references and uh yeah i think he he ruined his yeah because he told his wife exactly how what it would have creep he'd been but now he's like a bit of a hero maybe but but i guess he's like kind of a you know unseen behind the scenes hero because he's just trying to pass a message along mm -hmm. to, to the press so he's not really going to get so hey that that could be his uh unselfish act at the end there oh right avoiding uh avoiding a you know what nuclear war or whatever i mean the cuban missile crisis was what the closest we've come to it isn't it i mean so i yeah i yeah it's it's hard to we would, don't have enough the, evidence how would the missile crisis have gone though if khrushchev did have absolute candor at that time 
<laughs> that could have been a problem. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, you can you can sit there and analyze this this particular aspect of it. <laughs> um, how about the tripometer? Where do you want to put it on the tripometer? I don't know, man. Again, I just feel like the concept of a haunted car was just way underused here. Um, I, oh, I think I think the trip meter would be more for the audience for the fact of these real life references. Um, so I guess it's a trip in that regard, but just as an episode, I think I feel like it's really low. I want to give it maybe two, two and a half. Okay. Um, I was thinking three because of the the signs mostly those signs were really trippy um, okay <laughs> i just i don't know I, I thought that was highly amusing so that's that's where my but and, and then just yeah the dialogue uh as you said it's not the best written episode but the dialogue is pretty sharp when it's sharp so i really mm -hmm. dig oh, yeah. that no um, I, I laughed a lot and my wife was watching it with me and she laughed too so you would have preferred the car from a thing about machines that chases the guy into a swimming pool. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that was oh, a haunted but, car, right? You no, know, it was fully. Yeah. And, and I, God, I like that one so much. It, what, yeah. I just need, I need a little more. If you're going to call something haunted, I was like, let's see it do something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I guess that's your example of a similar episode done better. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. There's just, it has... And I feel like we've talked about one before this more than once with season one. There are just some that, that were just like, okay, well, you know, this is this is there are good ideas here, but I feel as far as execution, they were done, you know, because you can't run as long as Twilight Zone did without repeating kind of themes and you know, protagonists and and MacGuffins and whatever, you know. Although I did like Jack Carson as Harvey Honeycutt a little better, I think, than the guy in the thing about machines, because Harvey Honeycutt's right on that line of being likable and completely unlikable at the same time. Where in the thing about the machines, the, the dude's like insufferable. <laughs> yeah, no, no. This is a in terms of a character the audience will like end up relating to. Yeah, because he starts out. I mean, he has a true arc. I mean, it's it's a you know, my I've I've said this a lot of times. But my favorite thing about Twilight Zone is just the account economy of storytelling that they have i mean they really do it's just incredible what they're able to do in uh in that compressed running time um every once in a while we mentioned the the 2000s era radio dramas um are you familiar with the radio drama for this one i know that it wasn't khrushchev in the radio drama oh no they changed it to like um uh, like someone from the middle east but the, the main point is um in, in your wheelhouse, the uh, the star performer in that one is Henry Rollins. So, doing I guess he's doing the Honeycut role. <laughs> Sweet. So I just I had that, no uh, idea. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I saw that watching it and, and, and it shows the special features and it's like radio drama starring Henry Rollins, which I didn't have time to listen to, but um, I was like, oh, that I I probably will because I just want to see how that plays. That's gonna be mm. wild. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know. Henry was always like part stand-up comedian, you know, sometimes completely stand-up comedian, depending on what you saw him do. Well, my main thing with him was those three good songs on, um, was it the end of silence or whatever? And um, otherwise I was just listening to all his, you know, spoken word cassette tapes in my car. I didn't really listen to the music. <laughs> no, I've seen the band or saw the band cause it's not, it's, he doesn't even play music anymore, but, um, I saw him just by himself talking way more times uh, than I ever saw the band. It eventually became what I was more interested in. And I couldn't even tell you what the album, what you know, the band was up to at a point. Uh, do you have any other big points on this episode? Um, no, not really. I mean, again, it's not one of the ones that I would consider a favorite. Um, I, I think, uh, um, there are ones that I like a lot better that do kind of similar things, not just in season two, but maybe in even season one and beyond. Um, but this is, I would definitely read more about it from a historian's perspective. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it's certainly ripe for, like you said, it's one you'll watch when you're doing a rewatch of the show, but if you're cherry picking, not it, might not, it might not stick out so much. No, and I don't even remember it being part of the marathons. Yeah, like I said, it's not one I was particularly familiar with. 
So Mm-mm. maybe it was on a marathon. The whole thing just was kind of over my head, but I just feel like the premise for what it is, um, is not going to make an impression. I think it's more subtle what it's doing. Maybe this was the part of the marathon when you, when you took a crap. <laughs> It's like a whole truth is on. Well, it's time to hate, take a whole duke. <laughs> um, it is the middle of November. I know you have some stuff coming up. You want to rap about it? Absolutely. Yeah. Our new movie, Jug Saw, is finally available on DVD and Blu ray if there's any left by the time um, that this episode drops. Uh, our annual um, underground movie show is going to take place at Athens City on December 2nd and 3rd. And then on the fourth, we'll do a live stream via our YouTube channel, but that's going to be live. So, you know, it's not something that's going to stay there. Liberty live. Okay. There, I was rapping for you. Um, there you go. <laughs> it's time enough podcast. It's time enough pod on Twitter and Facebook. We do lots of podcasts. You can support us on Patreon at podcastio podcastius, where we also talk about sci-fi films at Matt and Luke's Sci-Fi Sanctuary. And if you're a gamer, you can get into the games with Luke Loves Pokemon, Monster Mash, doing the Monster Hunter, and the Game Game Show, which is for British guys screaming insults at each other. I've been told I should keep. I, I've been told I should continue using that as the description for that show. So, <laughs> great. Okay. What can I sell you? I can, I can sell you this duster. Ah, how are you? It's only eight years old. It, it, it barely has any dust in it. I, I'm dusting things with it now, and it's all looking slightly better. 80 bucks. What do you think? Uh, I can sell you. This is the ring from Bad Girl Dracula. Oh, that's an actual film collectible then. Yeah, it was. Uh, I don't want to sell that. This is painted by... Extina Pierce Tomlin for the movie, and um, she was not in it, but uh, yeah, this is a pretty, this is a pretty great thing. I don't know if it has the same powers as Sex Feratu had in the movie, because I'm not a lesbian vampire. But if you know a lesbian vampire, you can test it out and see if it's more than just a, just a cool looking prop. Maybe someday. <laughs> Maybe someday you too can be a lesbian vampire. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I did. I did one more. I did another instrument trade because I got the electric cello a few years ago. Because yeah, I was like acoustic guitar, electric guitar. There's things good about both, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing better about electric cello than a real one. So I traded the electric one, and uh, got got another thing toy to play with. Hold on, that's my midlife crisis: collecting guitars. Is that what's going on? This this one, it's like, I don't know how much like it's going to end up on songs, but I think it's something that I end up playing more just for the hells and giggles. Uh-huh. Although I already put it in a track or two, so I mean, it's not, yeah, not. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very cool. Dobro resonator, yeah. right? And uh, have you ever played one of these things? Just at the at the music store. So what do you lap. use, a knife or a like, slide, or what do you use? There you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah just... Uh... I don't know if that came through or not, but... No, I heard it. It sounds great. Fun as shit. And then you can, you know, if you play it like this and put it on your pinky and you kind of do the, the Delta blues sort of thing, like, so that's kind of, you know. Yeah. Now, is it, do you have to use an open tuning for that? I mean, you could tune it regularly if you want, but yeah, you don't want to tune it open. The, I tried to, I wanted to go bluegrass open C, uh-huh. but I broke like four E strings trying to do that. So I was like, okay. Oh, op- so I've settled on open E for my tuning. <laughs> I was going to say open E would be what my guess would be. But it sounded really good in open C because uh, these three strings mirror these three strings when you tune yeah. it that way, which makes it, you can get these really cool patterns. But then you also You're end up buying like 
Yeah, you're just snapping strings like a <laughs> madman. So <laughs> I got um did I send you a picture? But I got an electronic drum kit for 50 bucks. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You did. How how is the sound on that? It's awesome. Like I I practice I, I was I over the years I've practiced drumming to um R and B hip hop and dance music and not rock and roll, which is why I can't play faster. <laughs> but like um I actually the settings on it have like the TR, I don't know if it's 808 or 909, but it sounds enough like it to where I could play on a, you know with to straight out of Compton or something like that. I know when I had the um the Roland one several years ago, I usually left on the jazz setting. Like 90% the of the songs. Great. Yeah, 90% of the songs I used. I so I, what I would tell you to do is play on a jazz setting. And then just play along with songs you like, but you know, don't try and play exactly what the drums in that song. Just play. Oh right? no, no, that's the way I do anyway because I have a little more of kind of a swing that's kind of a round, okay. and, and a drum machine doesn't swing. So, so honestly, I would say do some of that and then send me those, <laughs> and don't yeah, tell like, me what song you're doing. <laughs> no, I, I won't. Like I, can't. <laughs> I'll just set it, set the recorder, and again, I can go direct so i'll just yeah. be monitoring it with uh and and i've uh, done i actually like doing that um method a lot um a few songs i've done that with is from the last electric sages a spot of purple mm -hmm. is dan just playing the drums along with sunday driver wow really so listen to a spot of purple and think of sunday huh. driver you'll hear it because he actually i mean he was actually literally just playing like he was testing his new kid out and he sent me the track and i was like well, no one's gonna like no one's gonna notice, no, no one right? Will know. No, um, I'm I was I think I was playing along this stuff the other times I sent you things. Oh yeah, mate. Oh, you were playing along with my tracks. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but, it's just so much more convenient than the kit because when the kit lives in the room, it's just like takes up that whole side of the room and you can't really it can't do anything. No, but no, this, I, yeah. Uh, I get what you're saying. So um what what else was uh there's a the castle of illusion i think i was on bohemian groovers and that uh that is actually my drum track from 20 flight rock <laughs> yeah and high desert prophecies yeah, yeah i was funny. i was playing along with the um the first song on my bloody valentine's loveless <laughs> So okay, that I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have known, but that's, well, that's, awesome. that's the whole point. Like when you do, that's why I'm like, don't even bother to maybe after I'm finished, I'll be like, Hey, do you remember what song you played? Then I'll be curious, but um, it's maybe going to be, I mean, I play along with a lot of um, Cardi B. <laughs> so. Oh God. And um, the, um, the rental store, since nobody likes CDs anymore, they've been hemorrhaging their rental CDs for like 50 uh -huh. cents a piece. Wow. And just it's it's ridiculous what I've been getting out of there. They got the what do we get? 80s anthrax remastered. The the abstract dragon. You ever hear that one? No. Buster rhymes and Q tip. Very, very good shit. Whoa. Um through Jurassic Five. Okay. That's here's, amazing. Here's a big ever hear this album, Nas and Damian Marley. No, I've never heard it. Very good like cool. insanely good no I'm, I'm a fan of nas definitely i had no I, I don't know if i've ever heard damien marley at all well you'll like him after you hear that album but yeah that i mean that one's on youtube you should look up uh that one for no, sure i will i will like, try, try, i'm trying to find the here's some weekend album oh <laughs> when everything's 50 cents you, you buy shit like that of course <laughs> oh man is that like the debut it's no it's the second album with my prerogative and don't be cruel oh okay but just yeah, lots of oh, the fifty cents for like I, all three of his uh, holy shit black, now voodoo. black black messiah brown sugar and voodoo all for fifty cents. Oh my god, voodoo is seriously the I think that when I started like really dedicating myself to playing drums, voodoo was the thing I play along to like religiously. Yeah, just uh, there were several Roots albums were in there. Oh wow, it's just like insane. I I've bought like. 100 cts in the past <laughs> month <I'm> sure <laughs> you got some good stuff holy shit no yeah, yeah it's just it's, it's, like i'll come in like one day they're clearly like cleaning out the rock section mm -hmm. so i finally got those um 
those chili pepper albums with like the Josh, whatever his name is, just you know, Klingo Klingo Klingo. Klingo. yeah, you know? it was by your side and, and getaway. The getaway. And getaway is quite good. So I was gonna say, I by your side, I still haven't really. It's I never okay, got it, but it's, but it's, like it's... getaway is great. I mean, there's that's my thing. Like I talked to a, my friend John went to see um went to see uh chili peppers on this most recent tour it was before it was between the two albums were released mm. and i was like but it was the first tour back with Frushanti, and i was like okay so i know Frushanti's never played any of the stuff from the navarro stuff but is he playing any of the stuff with klinghoffer and he's like no mm. Why, well now he has two albums of new material to play <laughs> yeah well i do know that when he came back um, this time the first thing they did was he wanted to play only stuff from like the slovak recordings through like mother's milk and blood sugar he didn't want to go into any of the stuff you know after that he wanted to yeah, concentrate on all the early material that's especially clear from the new new album i was gonna say how there were so so many times where i i felt like oh i and and i do like vocally I do like the newest one, the Dream Canteen more. I think I do it's too. I just wish much he, more interesting. I just wish he'd go a little more ape shit when he goes into the rap parts because he does them too chill now. Because when I was listening to By Your Side, he was still hitting it when he do those parts. And I'm like, yeah. what? why isn't he now? You know? I feel like, have you listened to any of the live recordings from the most recent tour? No, not really. I think yeah, I saw well, like one or two, but not a okay, lot. Okay, yeah. There, Sirius XM did you can hear the entire uh, Apollo concert that mm. they did. And it feels like Anthony is not going there out of, out of, out of consideration for his vo his voice. That's kind of what I was thinking. Cause you know, he's hitting his notes fine. It's just when he does the no. little rappy parts, he's not no. really hitting them so hard. What he's gained as a vocalist in terms of his, his handle of pitch uh, and his forcefulness, uh, uh, he I think he's lost is as just like, for lack of a better term, a, a rapper or an MC. Well, the crazy man side of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was oh, yeah. the only thing that was missing from some of those ones, because I was like, damn, this sounds like party plan. This sounds like freaky styly, except for you don't have the strong vocal from him on the rap stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. More more 50 cent CDs. I got a 50 cent album for 50 cents. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's I've never, I couldn't I've never gotten into him production wise I think they're fine but I just as an MC I don't think he's that great well, I'm just for 50 cents I'll try 50 cent right well actually my, my Maddie was like oh you gotta copy the masker for me because it's it's the perfect boxing album because he's a boxer so okay he says per, no, a few others are the beanie man it's fun stuff uh, which yeah. was playing the car with Maddie he was like oh this is Jamaican fuck club music <laughs> That is true. That's what it's known for. There's a Mad Lib, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. Tons of good. Uh, Flying Lotus is your dad. And then I got Cosmogramma, but I already own Cosmogramma, so I just gave it to Scott when I met up with him last week. <laughs> but yeah, wow. tons of good stuff in there. So Yeah. Yeah, if you, uh, I, I can always send MP3s of random shit if you need it, but yeah. I don't know. I still <laughs> like listening to albums, so I guess, I guess you do no, too. <laughs> I do too. That's the thing. I I put on you know, I'll, I'll sit with an album for like, you know, a week. I'll just rep have it on repeat. So I'm, I'm finished my cycle of dream canteen and I'm actually <laughs> right at the moment, um, listening to the Taylor Swift midnights. <laughs> oh, okay. See it's my wife. I was like, tell my wife who's new Taylor Swift because she loves it and she's there is. I'm like, how'd you miss the promotional for that? <laughs> that was like all over the place. <laughs> I mean, I, I just, um, it's not all of it is kind of what I like, but I, I feel like, I don't know, like, like, you know, have you, have you heard of Haim? H-A-I-M? I've heard of. <laughs> okay, see, Lena really likes Haim, but Haim's music largely is not like the song Steps, which is a freaking great song. It's more like dance pop mm. with just, you know, more interesting production. Taylor mm. Swift is that same way. Like, she's in that same pocket. Mm. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So, um, yeah, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of hers, but whatever. It's I can certainly deal with it. Like, like I'd rather if my wife wants to play her music in the car. That's definitely 
far above, say, putting on Maroon 5. So, <laughs> God, no. No, th- I don't own any other Taylor Swift. This is my first time ever getting it because I listened to the singles as they came out. And I was like, okay, well, you know, I like it. And, and mm-hmm. you know, it passed the test of Lena liked it too. Because if I buy a new album and it's not something she likes, I don't get to hear it as much. <laughs> right. <laughs> And you never know what's going to get the pass from a nine-year-old critic. Yeah, I got to start making my run. So, well, I told you when Hana was six or seven, we we could only play Prince in the car. So that was kind of fun. (laughs) I mean, there's enough... There's enough Prince music. I mean, it's not like you have to listen to the same thing over and over. (laughs) Oh, no, no. Well, that's the thing. She gets really stuck on, like, one particular album. And it's like... Because, like, Halsey is another favorite of hers. And we still have not heard the new Halsey. (laughs) It's been out for, like, a year. (laughs) Okay, I'll catch you later. See you, man. Word up. Bye-bye.